I'm Andy Dwyer, and when I'm not pulling suckers off my tomato plants in my garden, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what are some things you should never do with your money? This isn't about what I did in Vegas back in 06, is it? Okay, uh, okay, good deal. Today, we're going to detail five things not to do with your money, none of which are about Vegas or discount sushi. Joe promised. Joining our group of award-winning financial media peeps from FinanciallyIntentional.com and the Nurses on Fire podcast, it's Nasima McElroy. Next, from this podcast, please welcome a guy you've heard too I mean, not enough of, oh, gee. And from LenPenzo.com, it's Wayne Newton. Oh, man, Wayne is... Oh, it's not Wayne Newton. It's just Len Penzo. Don't go shame. Anyway, plus, hoping for scholarships for someone you know, Pam Andrews, the scholarship shark, joins us to tackle what you need to know about scholarship hunting this summer. Later, we'll magnify Matt's money, who wants to help his wife transition into business for herself. Oh, that's romantic, Matt. And what might he be missing? And don't worry, I'll get you thinking with my farming-related trivia. And now a guy you, you should never listen to when it comes to winning board games, it's Joe Saul Sihai. I never win board games, but I always have a good time playing board games. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Weekend Fun for the Win. I'm Joe Saul Sihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And let me be the first one to welcome you to a fantastic weekend show we have planned and across the card table from me we'll start with him mr og is here what's happening you know i'm ready to podcast i've got my uh iced tea lemonade iced tea lemonade mix a little Gosh, gross there's only a name for that <laughs> if, if only somebody would come have you seen with the it. have you seen that espn commercial where this you know it's obviously in arnold palmer is what we're talking about you know, they would always bring the famous people in to do the ESPN commercials and they had him and he was going through the line of food and he goes and he grabs his cup and he fills it up with iced tea and then walks a little bit and then lemonade and then comes back and everybody's kind of confused and they're watching him. And so then like Scott Van Pelt's next and he kind of does it and he takes a sip of it. And he's like, Meh, pretty good. You know, and like, that's horrible. Made the Arnold Palmer. And yeah, Arnold Palmer like, making an Arnold Palmer. Yeah. That's pretty damn funny. Great. Very meta. Yes, absolutely. And a guy who's very meta deep under Los Angeles in his bunker, Mr. Lempenzo's here. Yes. And if you stop by the bunker, don't ask for any Arnold Palmers because I don't have any Arnold Palmers. You'll get water and MREs and that's it. (laughs) And you'll like it. Like it. Do you have at least salt or saltine crackers or something? (laughs) Those those come in your MREs. The big, (laughs) big old saltine crackers. Perfect. (laughs) Because, you know, it's it's funny. We went on an eight-mile hike this last weekend and uh, didn't realize we were going to hike that long until we got there and uh, realized we didn't have any food. But we had two packets, Len, two packets of Wendy saltine crackers that we threw in the bag. I'll tell you, when it's mile five of your hike and you're malnourished, nothing tastes better than a Wendy saltine cracker. Uh, you know, you always had each other, too, if worse came to worst, oh, you know. Nice. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> <laughs> we we start, start look, looking. Wow, that, that took a morbid the turn. Party. That took a morbid turn. The Saul Sea High Party become what? the next famous. Uh, oh, oh boy! Mm. <laughs> and wondering what she's still doing Moving here on. after that. We're like, hey, where did Nasima go? All of a sudden, she's like, oh, sorry, Joe, my shirt waist stopped working. Miss Nasima McElroy's here. She's back. Hey. hey. So happy to be back, you guys. I was going to make that a little, I was going to take that joke a little bit further by talking about (laughs) lactating, but you know, we're not going to do that tonight or today. (laughs) I was going to say spoken like a true uh, woman who works with babies all the time. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Now you were telling us before we hit record that, uh, and, and for people that don't know what you do, tell them exactly what you do. 
Well, <laughs> professionally, yes. I am a labor and delivery nurse. I've been a labor and delivery nurse for about 12 years. So I help bring life into this world. But I'm also the founder of Financially Intentional and the Nurses on Fire podcast, <laughs> which I like to do on the side. That is awesome. And I'm so happy you're finally podcasting. What made you decide to finally get in the water? Well, you know, I felt like nurses needed to know about this whole movement. And I feel like nursing is the ultimate like hack to financial independence. So I wanted to introduce nurses to the fire movement. I thought you were about to say, well, that Stacking Benjamin show is not that good. And I thought, you know, people needed a better show. So there we go. No, I'm trying to be just like you, Joe. Absolutely. There you go, Naseeva. That's why we keep having her back. Uh, you also have a book out, by the way. Oh, I do. Actually, yes. It's called Smart Money. It was released in March. So yay, all the things that I wish I would have known about money in my early 20s. That's all she's doing, OG. She just has a blog, a podcast, a book. Like, uh, uh, if I want to deliver babies, you know, in her free time. <laughs> I feel like and such have a two kids homeschooling. Oh, come you know, on. All that oh, stuff. Now she's right. laying it we on. We get it. We get it. We yeah, get we're it. Losers. We're losers. We got it. We're you losers. win. Hey, Nasima, have you ever hiked eight miles on a Wendy saltine cracker? That's all I'm saying. Well, the running joke between me and my friends is that black people don't hike. So <laughs> there's the answer to that. <laughs> there, there it is. Well, there's our answer. We've got Nasima here. We got Len here. We got OG here. We're about to talk about things. One blog says you shouldn't do with your money. But first, did you know with the More Rewards credit card from Navy Federal Credit Union, you can earn three times the points at supermarkets, food delivery, and gas, plus one point on everything else. So if you're playing the credit card reward game stackers and you only do that if you're paying off your credit card every month like you should – well, then you'll see how awesome this is. Your rewards won't expire while your account's open. You can redeem them for cash, for travel, gift cards, and more. Plus, the More Rewards card is contactless. You can make payments quickly and securely with just a tap of your card. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself. And see what I did there? With the new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone. And it's so fast, you can get a decision in seconds. Right now, rates are as low as 1.79% APR plus, and I love this, use this every time with Navy Federal's car buying service powered by TrueCar. So amazing. You can shop, compare, and save on your next new or used car. So whether it's your first car or your dream car, Navy Federal can help you cruise into a monthly payment that meets the budget and you know that you can afford it. Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD veterans and their families like me. American Express is a registered service mark of American Express used by Navy Federal under license, credit and collateral subject to approval, rate subject to change and are based on credit worthiness, rates available for new vehicles. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. All right, guys, let's get into this. Five things you should never do with your money, according to experts. Well, according to thesavvycouple.com. So let's roll. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. All right, this piece comes to us from uh, thesavvycouple.com. It's called Five Things You Should Never Do With Your Money, According to Experts. Well, I saw this and I clicked on it because... What a great title this is, Things That We Should Never Do With Our Money. And I always, by the way, I always worry about whenever anybody says never, Nasima, because of the fact that, I don't know about you, but whenever everybody says you should always do this, you should never do that, like I immediately think there might be some trouble here. You feel the same? Kind of reminds me of Dave Ramsey. Oh, nice. wow. we, kicked we, it up a notch. We went there. We went there immediately. <laughs> what do you mean by that, Naseeba? You know, like never invest while you're paying down debt, things like that. Yeah, I think when you um, fall into like dogmatic kind of ways and principles when it comes to personal finance, you get yourself into trouble a lot. And so I don't agree on the always and never Maybe, just maybe, though, this piece is going to knock it out of the park. Let's look at the first thing on the list and see what we think about this one. Uh, number one, never use just any bank. It can be tempting to stay with your first bank from when you were younger, but is that the best place to keep your money? 
Uh, we recommend you check out one of our favorites, Chime. I should also say, by the way, on the top of this piece, it also says this article sponsored by Chime. So that might be why they're their favorite because they just put money in the savvy couple's uh, wallet. But Len, this idea about any bank, never use any bank. Is that number one on your list of things you should never do with your money? <laughs> no, the first thing on my list of things I should never do with my money is take a whole bunch of it, put it in a bonfire and light it. That's number one on my list. So no, <laughs> you that, actually, that's not. You actually, wait a minute. The woman that just said that there's no nevers and no always is, was like, she gave you serious head nod, Len. <laughs> Well, there you go. So there, there's at least one thing you can, you should never do with your money. Uh, with banks though, yes, I do agree with the point that you can stay with the same bank for too long. And what I mean by that is over time, let's say, and I know these interest rates are terrible anyways, but just for example, a savings account interest rate is it drops and drops and drops. You are maybe missing opportunities for some higher amount of interest. You've got to, sh you've always got to shop around and keep your existing banks honest. So, same thing with fees. If they if they add new fees, I know my bank on occasion, the banks I've had in the past, they'll add new fees, and it just ticks me off. And so I shop around and change banks. So I know it's a hassle. Don't do it a lot, but you got to keep them honest. Don't get me wrong, Len. We're going to have the Magnify Money segment a little bit later in the show where we talk about how you can shop around and look for banks that have better fees. But in the big scheme of things, a bank with super low fees versus a bank paying a little bit higher interest on your money, how big a decision is this? Well, <laughs> I don't know. It depends how much money you're keeping with them, right? I mean, what you got to do is you got to look at how much money you're keeping with them and what those fees are. And you got to kind of figure out the interest. It really, there's a there's a, a rate that you're paying based on those fees, right? So you got to kind of figure that out yourself and then do a comparison. So you got to do the math, really. Nasima Len talks about comparisons. What do you look for in a good bank? First of all, I don't keep a lot of money in banks. And so some of those things aren't really as important. What's important to me is that my bank is accessible to me, meaning that I feel like historically banks have a lot of issues with people of color. So I want to make sure I feel comfortable at my bank. So that's before any fees or any interest <laughs> or anything. I want to know that I'm a value customer. I like community banks because I can form personal relationships with my bankers. Those things are important. I also need to know what the bank invests in. And so I like socially responsible banks that invest in the community. So those are some things that I look at. But I love to comparison shop when it comes to services that banks provide as far as like interest on car loans and things like that. And I think that Magnify Money is an excellent resource for that. And I use them often. We were talking to Terry Williams. I don't know if you know her, uh, the president of One United Bank, the biggest uh, black owned bank in America. And she was talking with us about some of the issues that uh, banks and people of color have had historically. And a lot of banks building things for other people on the backs of on the backs of communities, of people, Nasima, that can't afford all these fees that they've been handed. Yeah, it's a lot. I grew up in a family that was largely unbanked or um, underbanked. And so I'm probably the first person in my family that even looks at kind of fees and things like that or relationships with banks. Most of my family just has a huge mistrust. But you said that you don't keep money, much money in a bank. I'm assuming that money is not underneath your mattress at home. You're keeping money elsewhere. Yes, definitely. I love to have my money invested in working for me because, you know, I can work harder. I mean, my money can work 10 times harder for me than I can work for it. So I put it to work and sit in a bank. It's really not working that hard. Oh, gee, when it comes to bank, this thing is at number one. Where do you sit here? Well, I think, um, you know, in the biggest in the bigger scheme of things, I should say the costs and benefits and all that sort of stuff are really quite secondary to the relationship that you had, like Nasima said here, and then also kind of what are you looking for? If you just need to keep a few thousand bucks in a savings account or in a checking account as you're kind of go, like, don't spend any energy on this. I've just uh, gotten the latest book by Greg McEwen, Effortless. He wrote Essentialism. 
but he talks about like the minimum effort that's required to achieve something. I, I just think it's so funny the amount of time and energy spent trying to identify the bank that's going to give you the 0.002% rate of return instead of your 0.001 for your $847 that sits in your savings account. It's like, like, my goodness, that's such a waste of time and energy. You know, instead, try to find the opportunities that are going to be the big bangs for your buck. If you have to borrow money, make sure that you are getting a good rate for your mortgage or uh, if you're borrowing money for a car, try to find those things. And sometimes those things come with relationships at banks. We redid our line of credit at our house and our existing bank, that uh, credit union that we've used for years, uh, just didn't really want to play nice. And I don't know why, because they've been super awesome. Went across the street to the different credit union. They said, well, yeah, we can do something, but it would sure be nice if you had a bank account here. I said, sure, we'll move all our stuff. That's fine. You know, but like Len said, you don't want to be playing that game every other month. You know, that's a that's a once every couple of year type thing. Yeah, unless you're who do we we, we had the gentleman from uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin on the, the stacker on recently who does the savings account game where he's just getting those rewards for signing up. And he was making yeah. thousands of dollars uh, doing that. So if you're playing that game. Job. Yes, that that's is a his job. Side hustle. That is, that's, that's correct. His Uber. Speaking of that, number two on this list is never pass up free cash. And I go, duh, I love free cash. But then I look at what the free cash is that they're talking about. And Kellen writes, who would say no to free money? Well, in fact, a lot of us do pass up on these kinds of opportunities. If you're looking to get your hands on some free cash, we recommend you sign up for inbox dollars. I'm like, what is inbox dollars? <laughs> and here's the link. You, you get you yeah, here's here's the paid link. Uh, you get your free five dollar money. You could turn your downtime into moolah. Time is money, right? You could easily make money with a good side hustle. And I immediately thought, good side hustle. Yeah, uh, Nasima seems uh, inbox dollars is answering surveys, watching videos, they're signing up for different things and getting paid for it. Is that is that your idea of a good side hustle? No, definitely not. <laughs> It sounds like a time suck to me. I mean, like if you're just a couch potato, you might as well just do it. But the best side hustle or the best way to generate extra income is actually at your main job. I mean, I'm sure just by working one extra hour of overtime, you could have probably uh, paid for or made more money than this can earn you in a year. So I'll pass. You've talked a lot about how you worked hard toward financial independence is that how you did it? Working overtime as a nurse and then spending less time uh, or excuse me, spending less money uh, compared to what you make? Yeah, I just flattened my expenses. The real difference was understanding what was coming in and going out. And I actually didn't during the time I was like paying off my debt, which is when like I was moving massive <laughs> amounts of money around. Um, I didn't work ex overtime. I just like really, really maximized every single one of my dollars. But working overtime has been a great leverage for me to add to my investments and other things like that. But yeah, that is an ultimate way to grow your income. Like people look outside all too often for ways to generate income when they could probably like save time by just saying, Hey, I can work an extra hour today. I work an extra four hours. How did you flatten your expenses? Because a lot of people work that extra hour of overtime and I'm sure you see it all around you. People work that extra hour and then they, you know, that gives them permission to spend more money. Yeah. I mean, I had a goal for my money. And so every single one of my dollars had an assignment. So as soon as I knew that I was going to get an extra couple hundred dollars, it was already assigned to paying down debt or investing. That's, it sounds like a, a YNAB type approach. Like every yes. dollar has a job. Is that you? I love YNAB. Yes. Every single one of my dollars has a job. Land five bucks extra. You could give up that train set of yours and make a little money watching videos. <laughs> when you retire, what are you thinking? Here's what I'm thinking. That $5 is probably the, you're going to regret five. What you're exchanging for $5 is you're getting on a bajillion mailing list. That's what the first thing I thought of. It's like, okay, I got five bucks, but I'm signing up for this thing in box dollars. And I know you're going on a mailing list and they're going to sell it to two friends and they're going to sell your email address to two friends. And before you knew it, you're going to be inundated with junk. So before you take something for nothing, think about 
what you're actually getting. I mean, usually when somebody's willing to give you a token amount of money for something that you think's free, think really hard about really who's really making out in this deal. Oh, gee, do you agree with Nasima that the best way to make more money is through your main job? Well, yeah, I mean, probably. The other way to think about this is you can try to cut your expenses all the way to zero, but it's a lot easier just to make more money. And it doesn't seem like it's easier. That doesn't seem like the logical thing. When we look at our budgets and we look at our cash flow, or if there's times of stress in our life, the first thing that we think of is like, well, I got to cut this thing. We got to stop going out to eat or or I got to cut cable or something. We think of the cutting side of it, but improving the income side of your cash flow statement is a much more enjoyable way of doing it. I mean, it's a little more work for sure, but but it's much more enjoyable than than canceling, you know, NFL Sunday ticket or something. So I would say since you're already qualified to do the work that you're doing, especially if you're in a position or in a job where there's other people who do your work that you have the ability to say, Hey, I saw that you're working on Saturday. If you don't want to let me know and I'll pick that up for you. I mean, my goodness, that's uh that's easy money you're already qualified for. It. You don't have to have any training. How many times have we run stories too about the boss wants to give you a raise, but you just haven't asked. And I know also Nasima, women are more guilty of that than men, right? Women don't want to rock the yeah. boat, so they don't ask their boss for a raise. So they, they end up losing out on a lot of money. Yeah, it's a huge wage gap. But yeah, I think a lot of times people just don't ask. I would say set a reminder on your phone at least once a year to ask for a raise or look for ways to, like me, I'm a nurse. I can't just ask for a raise because we're on steps, because we're unionized. But like, I'm like, oh, I probably could advance my step by doing X, Y, and Z. Oh. So I set a reminder because I don't want to leave money on the table. That's fantastic advice. Number three, uh, Len Penzo, never skip out on a million dollars life insurance, Kellen writes here. Life insurance is one of those grown-up topics, he writes, that intimidate us all. We know we need it and it's important, but then put off buying it for far too long. Getting life insurance, one of the best things you can do for your family to make sure they'll be okay, even when you're gone. And then of course, there is a link. I'm sure it is a sponsored affiliate link to a life insurance company. So you can, you can do that. And by the way, I'm just going to stop right here for a second. Bloggers all the time bitch about commission salespeople and how you need a fee only financial planner and then they write a piece like this with all kinds of sponsored links where they're getting paid and they don't disclose shit. and it drives me crazy. Really? I should use a fee only financial planner, but you can fill your thing with commission based stuff in the article. Come on. Anyway, sorry. Rant over. Uh, Len, million dollars of life insurance. You're going to go pick up a million dollars right now. What? Wait a minute, Len. Let's go through this. You've kids at home right now, right? Uh, one left, those, one in the nest still. Th but those kids, your your daughter Nina needs your money if you pass away, right? She needs an extra million bucks, doesn't she? Well, I, you know what? I saw this. It's like, why a million dollars? I mean, this is like mindless. It's like, okay, a million dollars. Yes, let's all get a million dollar life insurance policy. You know, you, you got to think about the amount of coverage you want first off, right? So there's lots of factors here. It's not just everybody get a million dollar life insurance policy. A lot of it has to do with how much you earn and the, what your bills are. The object is to leave if something happens to you, especially if you're the sole breadwinner, You've got to think about how your family is going to cover life without your income. So there's – I hate rules of thumb. Uh, I'm not saying everybody should follow this. It just gives you an idea of what to think about. So basically the rule of thumb is I think it's six to ten times your income is what you would get for life insurance. That's just a rule of thumb. There's a little more into it than that, but that gets you in the ballpark. But wait a minute. So, you, you've already got – I mean, you're somebody though, if you took six to times, 10 times your income, me just what I have been a financial planner Len, for a long time, but I'm thinking that number is way too much life insurance for you. A million dollars. I'm just I thinking six, I, I'm thinking six to 10 times your income <laughs> where you're at financially in your life is that's, way yeah, too much I, life insurance. That, that's why rule. Well, yes. And that's why rules of thumb. They're terrible, but I mean, they just kind of get you in the ball. You're, you're correct. I don't even have a million dollar life insurance it's policy. Because I thought the exact I never opposite. did. I thought the exact opposite. I was like, wow, that's not even close to enough. But what? A no, million dollars isn't enough for Len? No, the ten, the ten x number. You oh, know, I, I thought. Started, you, hey, 
I, thought, I started with a half million. I started with a half million dollar policy. I've still got a half million dollar policy. It's kind of what's funny is the longer you live, um, you know, you don't need as much, right? Life insurance because the later you pass away, the people you're leaving behind don't need as much money. So it think kind about, of think pays about the big, the, the big things that you have to take care of if you can't work anymore because you got hit by the mail truck. Most people want to have their house paid off uniformly. That's like. That's check number one that gets written. Can I pay the house off? Check number two that gets written is can I fund the kids college? And if you're like got one left and you've got all the money set aside for 529s already for college, you don't need to do that. Like you're good. And then the third thing is can I maintain the standard of living to which I'm accustomed for my family without having to stress about going to find work right away? And if you're used to making seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, you're probably living on fifty of that. You know, you just do that god awful four percent rule. So you think about the big checks that you're going to write. Four percent rule, the cash flow that you need, and you're in the ballpark. Like like Len said, and maybe that's ten times, or maybe it's fifteen, or eight, or six, or whatever. But as you get closer to financial independence, you start checking off those big boxes. You go, well, the house is already paid off. I don't need to write a big right. check to Wells Fargo. Right. The college is funded. I don't need to do that. I have enough money in my retirement accounts to sustain my standard of living presently. Already, even with me living, therefore, I don't need to sustain a standard of living. So the, the trickles down pretty quick. And, and the kids uh, leave and the kids leave the nest instead of yeah. having to worry about four kids or five kids. Let's say if you have a five, you know, maybe there's only two left. So, right. you know, that's so it just kind of works. So way. buy whole life insurance is what Len's saying. <laughs> Million dollars a whole life. <laughs> As much as you can afford. <laughs> Got it. And buy it through Len's cousin who sells it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you could buy it by clicking yeah. this link. <laughs> Nasima, did you get really analytical about buying your life insurance? Um, not analytical. I kind of did use that 10 X rule because it was just easy for me. And I have little, little kids and I live in California. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, a million dollars really isn't a lot of money if something were to happen to me. So I didn't get super analytical, but I made sure that I had enough for what I think would cover. Uh, my kids have a long way to go before they're leaving any nest. That's funny, OG. We think about a million dollars as as a lot, but to Nasima's point, that's not a ton. Yeah, and it also matters the area that you live in. Yeah. Because they're in California, it's... It's a different standard of living than if you live in North Dakota, and that's okay. Or Texarkana. Or I wasn't going to say Texarkana, but Texarkana is like the California of Texas. <laughs> Actually, it's not. It's the exact opposite of the California was, of Texas. It's like, what? Huh? <laughs> number, number four on this list, never let, never let your credit score cost you thousands. Of course, there's a link at the Sponsored bottom of by. this one. Oh. Yes. Uh, two, uh, we love Credit Karma. They're at the bottom. But uh, credit score, never let your credit score cost you thousands saying keep track of your credit score. Uh, Len, how often do you look at your credit score? I don't know. Not not often. Maybe, I don't know, once a year. I, I don't know. My credit's frozen, by the way. I think we've talked about this many times. So I really don't give a darn, be quite honest with you. So, uh, but I think I, last time I checked it, it was, uh, you know, it, it was still there. <laughs> I still have a credit <laughs> you score. Still, you still have one? <laughs> it, was at least, it was at least 350. <laughs> Somewhere between 350 and 850. It's getting there. No, I'm shooting for. I'm shooting to get to the 600 club. Oh, that's, that's good. 600 club. That's my goal. The SEMA credit score. How often do you check it? I actually check it often. Not as often as I did when I was buying a house, but it's relatively important. I think um, there's a big focus on credit score in my community versus like making more money. And so I tell people, focus on making more money. Okay. Money is greater than credit to me. So but, that's just my opinion. But it's funny. We all, I mean, growing up, my credit score was very important to me and my parents emphasized credit score. And I think that's part of the reason I got into a lot of debt was, I mean, not because of the fact that I wanted a lot of debt. It was because I always knew credit was important. Like credit is important. And then you think through Nasima, what you're saying, really borrowing money more important than building wealth. Uh, not to me. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Not to me. <laughs> Number five on this list. And I hey, think Joe, we'll just real quick, yeah. just one thing where credit score seems to be important is, and I don't rent, but people who rent, don't they check credit scores? I mean, so maybe that's one area where you might, it might be important. Well, it's, it's on your automobile insurance. It's on your house insurance accounts. Now, if you go to rent a car, like rent a car, 
if you want to use a debit card instead of a credit card, they'll check your credit score for yeah. that sort of stuff too. So it's probably, it, it probably is more important for younger people just starting out. I so. think that is, I think that is a great point. There's a season when you, you do need to know credit, but I think you need to know how to build wealth as much. And your goal should probably be, how about this? Can we agree on this? Your goal should be to focus on having more money instead of having more open credit lines. I just want to say that a lot of people who are digging themselves out of debt, credit is important because a lot of times they have a lot of high interest debt. And um, if they can fix their credit, they can kind of leverage lower interest rates to get out of debt faster. So that's another way that credit would matter. But it depends. Like I said, I think, it, like you said, I think it's a younger person's problem or somebody who's like really highly leveraged. Well, and I like that you say that because that's what I thought Kellen was saying at the beginning of this. And I kind of nodded my head as I was reading this. We got to number four and I was like, OK, here's one finally that I agree with because a bad credit score can cost you thousands of dollars if you're digging your way out. But then it ends up being a Credit Karma commercial. So which number five on here is don't miss out on $200 plus in free stocks. I'm like, well, well, well. And of course there's a link to, of all the brokerage accounts, Robinhood, because Robinhood never Go won. Robinhood. Keep Ro it in the hood. <laughs> Robinhood never lies to you, Deceba. I don't know if you know that. Robinhood never lies to their, to their users and hasn't gotten in trouble for that at all. No place I'd rather not put money than Robinhood. Sorry to Kellen for kind of calling out this piece because uh, Kellen, this is not the only bad piece like this on the internet, but I want to kind of wrap this up with, you can't just look at a piece like this, uh, much like OG, we talk about when you watch CNBC, when you're watching anything financially related, you got to ask, where's the author coming from? And here, clearly, we've got five links to products that pay <laughs> Kellen in this in this piece, right? I mean, it's just like if we get somebody who's a who's a growth stock fund manager on CNBC, they're going to talk about how now's a great time for growth stocks. It's all the same. Or AMC, but yeah, yeah, same, same. Yeah, GameStop all the way. <laughs> GME to the moon. <laughs> you believe it's still going, still going on crazy. Let's talk about your takeaways. Maybe not from the piece, but takeaways from the discussion. We'll let our guest of honor go last. Len, biggest takeaway from uh, today's discussion? Gosh. Um, don't burn your cash. <laughs> OG? I think that uh, while we kind of poked a little fun at uh, kind of the way that the message was delivered, I think that there's a couple of good messages here. You know, think about how you spend your time and energy set yourself up for success. And and when you think about the things that you want to spend time and energy on, it's making more money. It's making sure that your family's protected. It's making sure that you're, you know, you know what your credit score is or more specifically how it's, how it functions. Like what are the levers that happen? And if you have the ability to influence those, like for example, we know that 35% of your credit score is based on payment history. Don't be late on your payments. Like that's a major factor in your credit score. It's not about going out and getting credit cards. That's not about that. That's not how you build your credit score. It's don't suck at making payments. That's the way to do it. So I think it's a function of just like thinking about what makes the machine work and knowing what, you know, where you have to uh, kind of put yourself in it. And Nasima, you got the last word. I guess my biggest takeaway is there are rarely nevers and always when it comes to personal finance, but the general rule of thumb, and we all talk about this in some way, shape or form, but it's flatten your expenses, increase your investing, and that's the way to build wealth. So all these other nevers and always can, you know, kind of fall by the wayside. Hey guys, you know what time it is? It is unofficially summertime. And for most of you, that means uh, time for a well-deserved rest for students. But gather your students around the listening device because you know what? Whether you've got somebody who's in college now, headed to college, might want to go to college in the future, Pam Andrews is here. She is the scholarship shark and there's a lot of stuff going on coming up in July. We want to give you as much information as possible. And at the same time, our scholarship mastery course is opening back up. I know a bunch of you are on the waiting list waiting for it to open and we're super excited. 
to get a new class going and working on scholarships with Pam. So here she is with as much scholarship info as we can fit in the next 15 minutes. Pam Andrews coming down to the basement. Back again, one of my favorite people in the world, the scholarship shark herself, Pam Andrews is here. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's good to be here. Well, we've been talking about college a lot and you've got college front and center in your family. I do. So I just graduated my third, third of four from high school and he starts this fall. So last weekend we did his high school graduation, did the backyard barbecue. So it was, it was just really good. It was really good. You know, you realize you think you have forever and then you realize you don't. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, that's where we are. Well, that's why I, (laughs) that's why I love this program too, because, and, and, and it's, it was a wake up call for me, man. All of a sudden my, I'm like, Whoa, I, I I gotta, I'm a planner, Pam. And Mm -hmm, there was mm -hmm. some stuff that I should have planned earlier. And you go, man, even if people are listening to this and you got kids in elementary school, start the college plan early. Absolutely. Planning is critical because the thing about it, the, the time progresses. We, we see that, you know, like you're as parents, we see our kids are going to move through stages, whether we are prepared for it or not. So planning and understanding like what the next steps are, are very important, especially in the college admissions process. You know, there are certain things that happen, whether you know them or not, whether you're prepared for them or not. And so planning is critical because once those deadlines pass, that's it. You know, the university and the colleges move on uh, with their next steps and their next stages. So it's important for families to understand what those steps are. Let's go through the all the hot buttons. We're going to start with the people that are sitting right on top of the hot button and then work our way back. All right. Uh, okay. So if you've got younger kids, you can maybe, I don't know if you really want to fast forward because I think that you probably want to hear this sooner rather than later, like what you're going to need to know. But if you're only worried about things for your kid's age, just hit the forward button a couple times. Uh, <laughs> but let's start off with people who have kids going to college this fall. What do, mm-hmm. I, what do I need to know that I might not know? What do people overlook? Is there anything for people that are like your son that are ready to head out? Yeah, so definitely check emails. A couple of things for those on the way out the door. I think this is the biggest transition for parents Because when our young folks are in high school, you know, we're in the loop a lot for the most part. But with college, with college, it changes. They're talking to the student. And even though we're responsible financially, at the end of the day, they, they are talking with the students unless your student has given permission for them to talk to you through this form and this process called FERPA, F E R P A. That's really important to make sure it's simple. Just log into your student's account in their portal, check the box. Yep. I gave my parents permission to contact the school. So that's really important. But then also have the conversation with your student, like stay on top of their emails, you know, especially this time of the year. So we're coming out of spring on into summer, you know, a few weeks or a few months, really, this is the last summer. There's going to be a lot of correspondence in terms of Uh, medical information and activities and course registering and paying, you know, typically the first payments are due around July, July 1. And one thing I want to say too, in terms of payments for students going in, a lot of times families don't know this, but let's say your student hasn't won all the money or has, you know, you don't have all the money that you need just yet. Check with the schools for installment plans. A lot of families don't know this. And so here's what I tell families. If you've already had a budget, you've already been paying money for soccer and dance lessons and music and all of that, and you're you're used to having a budget for your household, for your kids, now just simply shift some of that money over. So with an installment plan, you can spread that out over the next five months or four months or three. However, you know, each school has different plans, but that helps. And we've done that. Um, We've done that with kid number two, where she didn't win at all. And that was one way we were able to remain debt free. So we just simply said, okay, this part is uncovered. We still want you to apply for a few more scholarships, but which she didn't because, you know, social life happened and, and grades, which was fine. And, but it was manageable because uh, we got the installment plan. And the reason why I say this now in June is because Typically, you have until about July to do it because those first payments are due like July, August. Really important. So stay on top of your students' emails. Ask them for their login information. 
um, and just simply you have to bug them. And, you know, even though our kids are very responsible, yeah. it's OK. Yeah, it's OK to, to stay on top of it. Well, they haven't had yeah. many deadlines like this where they're they're adamant deadlines. I mean, these are serious, real right now get the stuff done or bad things are going to happen deadlines. Absolutely. Like they will send your kid home packing. Yeah, you know, if, yeah. if that bill, if, if it's not covered, they're not going to be taking classes. And when we're starting to see many campuses are opening back up because remember last year, you know, this, the global pandemic happened and most, if not, you know, pretty much all campuses, not all, but you know, majority of the campuses sure. had that residential experience. So many are opening again and, so it, we're back in that mode of, okay, I need dorm supplies and moving and, you know, depending upon where the school is, the travel to, to there and move in day. And, and so it's kind of back, I don't say back to normal, but we're slowly moving in that direction. Let's go to the next uh, group of people. And this, these are the people that you work with a lot, people that have mm -hmm. maybe juniors this year, right? Yeah. Or rising seniors, rising juniors, uh -huh. that group of people that are right now in the wheelhouse for a program like our program, Pam, the Scholarship Mastery. Yeah. So this is a time when you, it's never too soon to think about the money. So this is a time when they can start to do one of two things, either apply or prepare or both really. So there are scholarships available right now for, you know, students who are graduating seniors, of course, and then juniors and even, you know, younger, slightly younger. But this is a tip I like to share. Take a look at what's coming up, you know, those upcoming deadlines. So there, there are going to be a lot of deadlines in the fall. They're going to be ap college application deadlines, and they're also going to be scholarship deadlines. And so take a look at all of those and begin to gather your materials. You know, what, what does the application require? Think about who's going to write your reference or your recommendations. And these are the same people who will probably write them for you anyway for your school. So just go ahead and ask them now and lock it in. But begin to do some of that research, begin to apply. Because it's easier now, the summer and July and December are big scholarship months. It's a good thing. And then it's a where it's, tends to not be good. It's good because you have free time because you don't have school. But the challenge is you have free time and you don't have school. So, right. you know, students tend to check out mentally and say, oh, I don't want to write this essay or I don't want to do this. But what, this is the best time to do it. What, so, type, of, what yeah. type of scholarships are big in July? They're just a lot of private, a lot from law firms, dental firms, different foundations. But a, a lot, lot of the private money is July money. A lot of the private, absolutely. The private money. And it often... You know, you have fewer applicants, again, because students, they're transitioning. The weather's nicer. You're getting out. School's behind them for the year. So a lot of times they're just not thinking about money. And so, I, you know, this is just a really good time to take advantage of that because you're going to have fewer applicants in the pool. Who are the, who are the resources you tell kids and parents to turn to at their school to know when mm -hmm. uh, schools are visiting, right? You got colleges that yes. come visiting, college nights. Who do I interface with at school to make sure I get all that info? Yes, your guidance counselor is the go-to person. So I say do it one of two ways, or if not both. So definitely have a conversation with your guidance counselor, as well as, and, and I'll tell you in a moment, some of the other things you want to talk to them about. But go to your school's website to see if there's an upcoming college night. Sometimes they will have college fairs, visits an information night on maybe how to fill out the FAFSA or they bring in speakers like, you know, I speak at schools. <laughs> so, you know, they will bring in um, outside resources. So find out what that is and get those on your family calendar in advance. Um, and this is for, you know, your ninth, 10th, 11th, and even your 12th graders. But when it comes to the guidance counselor for your rising seniors, what you want to do is also ask, what's the best way for me to get my information from you? So your guidance counselor will have to submit your high school transcript to the colleges. And what typically happens if you're not planning, like we talked about a few minutes ago, if you're not planning, then you're going to be like everyone else. And in the fall, you know, a week or so, or even a few days before trying to figure out how to get it from them to the school. And your application is incomplete without that. So it's really important to know in advance, do I do it through our school portal? Is there a form I need to complete? Are you mailing it in manually? You know, um, some schools use Naviance and, or Parchment. So it's important to find out how do I get my high school transcript submitted? And knowing that early on is really important, as well as they, they will also complete what's called the school profile for your application so that when schools are uh, looking at you as an applicant, they know they're asking themselves, did Johnny choose the most rigorous courses? So 
there were 10 AP courses available and he didn't take any. So that way, when you're completing your application, maybe you can give some context as to why you did what you did or didn't do. The guidance counselor is also providing a profile letting the school know what is available at the school and a little bit about this school. Is it a magna school, a charter school? Is it, you know, whatever, whatever's yeah. happening at that school, a STEM school. So they provide all that background information. So when they're looking at you, they understand context for each individual student. I'm wondering about telling your counselor, I mean, guidance counselors think everybody wants student aid, right? Everybody's right. looking for, for scholarships, but it seems like that might be something you should vocalize because they're on top of local scholarships and there's lots of kids. I mean, I'm just thinking about advertising for yourself a little bit. You know what I mean? Yes, for sure. So one of the things I make my students do early on is meet with their guidance counselor and say, I'm applying for scholarships. Have any come across your desk? You know, I want to know about them. And I'm, I'm even willing to sort the mail and go through it, like volunteer to do that, you know, because what you have to realize your guidance counselors are also dealing with behavior. So it's not just the academic, but it's sometimes um, they're, they're also a resource in the school to deal with um, some of the other student conflict and relationship and some of that other stuff, not just college and career readiness stuff. And we're talking one to many, depending on the size of your school. I mean, it could be several hundred students. So at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. And I know it sounds harsh, but at the end of the day, you're responsible for finding the information and for taking those next steps. Although there are people available to help, you know, your guidance counselor has the information and will get some of that, uh, that information. It's up to you to get it. Um, you know, some are great. I've seen some, they will email their students and tell them about it. And some simply don't. And so we had two at the, we had two at the same school. The first guidance counselor, my twins had a Pam was absolutely horrible. And it wasn't just us, our junior year, uh, kids, junior year of college, she got let go that uh-huh. she, she was that bad. The woman that they had after her was phenomenal. And we knew everything. Uh-huh. I felt like I went from a desert of information where I just felt like there was nothing going on to suddenly there were events all the time. Turns out there were events going on all the time. I just didn't know it because we were relying on a guidance counselor and we should have. So I love that advice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think that's a part of the preparation phase. I I think families, parents aren't prepared for that. They think, well, this is their job. This is what they do. But it's important for you to follow up and follow through to make sure you get what you need for your young person. So really important. Uh, uh, Going to the next hot button. These are kids that are already in school. And I suppose this Mm -hmm. is even hotter than who we just talked about. People looking for scholarships for the future, people looking now. Uh, You and I have talked in the past that lots of people think that if I get past my freshman year and I didn't get any financial aid, I'm not going to get any. And that just isn't true. Not true at all. So here's what should happen. So you, you shift, I mean, you, the student, you shift from your high school senior year working solely with admissions, like getting in, and then, you know, you transition into financial aid a little bit. But once you step foot on campus, there's still scholarships available. And now I feel like you're, opportunities have opened up a little bit more because you can check with your department. So it's important to build a relationship with maybe the front desk person. Sometimes it's a student worker, sometimes, you know, the admin person in your department because they're scholarships to your department. Talk to financial aid again, just like you, you know, in high school, you're talking to your guidance counselor, build a relationship with your financial aid officer, really important. Um, And a lot of students don't do that until they're in trouble and they're trying to figure things out. So do that. Be proactive and do that on the front end, as well as check with professional organizations. So students tend not to think two or three steps ahead. So when you're in college, it's simply preparation for your career. And so if you are an engineering student, what are the national engineering organizations or associations, or if you're an art student, or if you're a nursing major, whatever. So find out what those are. And a lot of them have student chapters, as well as scholarships available. So that's really important, because they know you're moving in this direction, and they want to fund future nurses and future teachers. And so it's thinking a a little bit differently than just where you've searched before. So you can still continue to search and, you know, where you've searched before for scholarships, but, but it really does open up more and build relationships with your professors. You know, you'd be surprised. There are sometimes 
and I think students don't realize this, but there's sometimes scholarships and opportunities where they're selected, they're either peer selected or selected by the faculty. You know, they're voting on it and they're making decisions. And I've seen this happen many times. So it's really important to, you, you have a favorite professor, you do well your first semester, freshman year, go back to them, ask, you know, hey, I would love to be a TA, a teacher's assistant to maybe grade papers or check in with your students. Do you have any TA? Like build a relationship. And then you can say, hey, you know, do you know of any scholarships available or paid internship opportunities? So it's just ways, creative ways to get the money and you're building your resume at the same time and that relationship, uh, which is really important as well. It's so much different than high school. I remember being in college and realizing that relationships with my professors were so important. And I don't know, it was thinking about life less like a a high school growing child, nearly at adulthood to Mm -hmm. a very young adult, like the relationship changed immensely. And I was pretty intimidated by my professors. I remember thinking my first couple of years of hearing that advice and being very afraid. And then later on in college, uh, thinking, heck, I, I really need to get to know these people. And because of the fact that, I don't know, it went away from just grades to learning. Like I really wanted to learn the stuff and these people right. held the keys to teaching me about this stuff. And um, maybe that's the good part of taking seven years to get through college because you're paying <laughs> you're paying your own way through. <laughs> Joe finally grew grew up a little bit, but that relationship with the professor is super important. My daughter was one of those people too, Pam, that mm-hmm. also received uh, scholarships uh, her junior and senior year because of, of the fact that yes, because she yeah. was close to the faculty, she was close wow. to a couple of her professors. Yeah. Last up, people with with younger kids, let's talk about mm-hmm. freshmen in high school all the way down through, you know, seven, mm-hmm. eight, six, five, anything we should be doing? Yeah, I say start the conversations early. You know, when you're in the van driving, when you're sitting at the dinner table, um, just begin to talk to them about their future. Of course, stay financially, begin to, you know, the, on the practical side, invest and, you know, begin to prepare financially. But exposure, exposure in so many creative ways, especially as the country begins to open up again and campus is open, if there's a sports team um, and we did this, we had our local sports team that we enjoyed. So we would go to the games because they're fun. They're just fun family activities or theater or art, but just having your kids on campuses and, and talking with them about um, their future. And then on another very practical side, get those grades up and keep those grades up. So if you're struggling in an area, don't be afraid to get help, get a tutor, get, some help, reach out to your teachers. Because here's what a lot of students don't realize or think about. They don't think about early on when you apply for college in your senior year. So freshman, I mean, uh, first semester, the beginning of your senior year, schools are looking at the first three years of your grade. So they're looking at your ninth, 10th and 11th grade years. So what you do, your ninth grade year is critical. It's really important. So I tell students, you know, you want to start off well, you want, you know, you want to, it's like an airplane kind of taking off. So you've got the runway and then you want to take off. You really want to make sure that you are doing very well. And if you're finding you're struggling, get the help and get it early. So that's in terms of academics. But then in terms of extracurriculars, I would say get involved. On the younger side, I I have what I tell my students, learn, serve, lead. Um, I created that kind of concept. So you want to learn something and, and get involved in it and then serve in it. So, you know, let's say you love chess. And so you learn chess, you're part of the chess club, and then you get involved in the chess club. But at some point by junior year, you want to step into leadership. So maybe there are chess tournaments or maybe you create a very creative uh, fundraiser for, I don't know, the seniors in the park who play chess, w- whatever, but just begin to think, you know, you want to go a little bit deeper. So it's okay to have many interests and explore many things early on. But as you get higher up, you want to really, it's like an inverted triangle. You really want to hone in on a few things and master those few things and do those few things well. It's so exciting. And to your point at the beginning, it goes so fast. So get moving. Mm -hmm. The good thing is, Pam, you and I have a place where people can go to get to yeah. get ready. I know we have a bunch of people who are on the waiting list waiting for the doors to open again. The doors are opening today to our scholarship mastery program where you can work with Pam. And actually, if you're a parent, you'll be working with Pam a little. But the thing that we love about this program is that the student 
will be working mm-hmm. with Pam and with a group of like-minded uh, students. And what's really neat is not only do you learn about college, but you're also getting some life lessons about playing to the judge, right? Mm-hmm. And about uh, filling out a LinkedIn profile. I love the fact mm-hmm. that you do that with people. Where can people go to get more information, Pam? Yeah. So if you go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash scholarships, you can get more information on scholarship mastery. We only open, and this is very intentional. So I tell people when we open, if you've been sitting on that wait list, now's the time to get in, especially, especially since, okay, so this is June, you know, those big scholarships. Now's the time to build the whole engine. And and there are scholarships now, of course, in June, but they're going to be a lot more in July. And you want your student to go ahead and take advantage of that. And there's power in the group um, when we're all moving forward. And, you know, there's that level of accountability that happens that just doesn't happen on your own. So, yeah, that's one of the the benefits of being in the group and working through this process together to uh, find, apply and win scholarships. So definitely just go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash scholarships. And I'm so happy that we're able to open the doors again and uh, get on it, people. I mean, there's, you don't want to, you don't want to delay because the July money will be gone before we know it. Mm -hmm. And actually before we know it'll be September, which is horrifying to me. Yes. (laughs) Just ugly. Pam, thanks for hanging out again. And uh, let's go help some kids uh, get some money. For sure. Thanks for having me, Joe. This is great. Hey there, stackers. It's your bestest pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And you know, did you know that today is National Corn on the Cob Day? What a great holiday. I mean, corn is great. You can eat it in so, so many ways. Like, you know, either grilled on the cob or or boiled on the cob. And then, heck, I mean, there's creamed corn. And what better way is there to watch a movie than with a big old bucket of popcorn on the cob? It can be done. Turns out, if I did a genealogy test, I wouldn't be surprised to see that I'm probably like one-third Western European and two-thirds some cornfield out in Kansas. Hey, here's a mind-blowing activity suggestion. Listen to the band corn while you eat corn. I know, makes my head hurt too. With all that flexibility, it's no surprise to either you or me that corn just so happens to be big money in the U.S. I mean, like big, big, big money in the United States. In fact, it's the most valuable crop in the U.S. of A. So today... The trivia question is, how much money is corn worth to the U.S. economy? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can figure out a corny joke I could have said here, but totally held back on. Uh, Yeah, you're welcome. All right. If you're new to this show, we are having a year-long competition between our three regular contributors, OG, Len, and Paula Pant from Afford Anything. And Paula has the day off. So Nasima, you are Paula Pant today. Congratulations. There is some good news and some bad news though, Nasima. And we'll start off with the good news. The good news is you're going to get to guess last. But the reason is, is because Paula is in last. So mm-hmm. Paula has six, Len has seven, and OG has nine. So that's the way we're stacked up currently. Oh, gee, you're going to lead the way. How much money does corn add to the U.S. economy? So we're thinking of this in like GDP, the output output of corn in the United States. Yes, yes. The amount of money that corn, so you take all what? The corn sales, corn jobs. What does corn do? (laughs) Corn jobs. (laughs) Corny. It's a corny way to do stuff. All right. So I think that the U.S. economy is 20 trillion GDP. Because is that about what our debt is? I remember somebody saying that the debt number, the GDP number are very similar. So let's say 20 trillion, probably rounding up. Uh, Corn, as Doug alluded to, is super profitable. There's like supercomputers and I mean, you can't leave out wheat and the snap P population and I mean, goodness, uh, I'm going to say that the corn industry is a $825 billion industry in the United States. $825 billion. Len? 
Oh my gosh. I don't know. $825 billion. So th- th- this is, you weren't talking to everything related to corn, right? You're not just talking about the crop itself. It's the entire industry, including jobs, Len. Okay. Um, well, then here's what I'll say. I mean, gosh, if the GDP is $20 trillion, which I actually think it's a slight little more than that, but $20 trillion. So, OG, you're saying basically that corn is 5%, 5% of the American America's GDP. I think that's too much. So, I'm going to say – I won't Chelsea Brennan yet, but I'll say eight hundred billion. So you don't think it's that much different? All right, no, you know what? I'll play. Uh, you know what? I'm in the spirit of. I'm going to say half a, a five hundred billion. Five hundred billion. Five hundred billion. Yes. A little more than half. All right. Yeah, I give OG some uh, breathing room there. Sounds collegial. I don't know what the hell happened. How did you guys become friends? Wait, when did this? <laughs> when did this love fest start? I have no idea. This is supposed to be a cutthroat competition. Nasima, you've got eight twenty-five billion and five hundred billion. What are you thinking? I'm gonna shoot way low so that I can like get everything in between. I'm gonna say sixty billion. Sixty billion dollars for Nasima. That is way, way lower. You're thinking they're too much corn. Way too much. Could be. Nasima could be right. (laughs) Well, here's the deal. We'd love to tell you who's right, but we don't play it that way. We're going to be right back with that. Well, if you're new to the Stacking Benjamin show, you haven't heard me brag about how I'm friends with these two awesome podcasters, Don and Tom, the host of the Talking Real Money podcast. They are not Johnny Come Lately podcasters. They've been doing this for a long, long time. Tom used to be on PBS. Don was a broadcaster all the way back in 1988. I was two years out of college, two years out of college. I was in college, two years out of high school in 1988. Don and Tom, because of their longevity, they have this unique skill set as both broadcasters and financial experts, and they focus on making money easy and understandable and all based on solid science and not stuff that's worked the last day or the last year, the last three years. In fact, if you look at them, they have over 600 episodes and they talk about everything. So it's really easy to find a topic that you're interested in and dive in. If you're like me, you'll just let it play because they, they're, they're funny, they're fun. We have a great time listening to Don and Tom at the Talking Real Money podcast. So learn how to invest better, worry less, spend less in fees and commissions by listening to Talking Real Money. You can listen to them wherever you're listening to us now, or you can go to TalkingRealMoney.com, or we'll also have a link in our show notes at StackingBenjamins.com. I used to always be afraid of the next thing that we were going to design, and I have to tell you, now I get really excited about it because of the fact that I have Canva Pro, and our Stacking Benjamins designs are now next level because of it. Canva Pro is this super easy to use design platform that has everything that you need to design like a pro. So whether you're a professional designer or just getting started or somewhere in the middle like me, Canva Pro can help boost you and your team's productivity and creativity. It's quick, it's easy, and it's an affordable way to design whatever you need because no matter what you're creating or sharing, they have everything in one place, including a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audio, and graphics for you to start with. What I love about this is that it gives me a template to begin with, and I'm so much more confident. And then I'm able to create these cool designs, whether it's cover art for an episode, it's the next thing that I'm putting on Instagram, whatever it is, there's these fantastic, beautiful looking, attractive things that make people like whatever you do. You know, it's funny. I see tools like Canva Pro and I think of some of the just absolutely rotten stuff I see when people are marketing their product and and design is everything. I I don't think I'm the only person who's a sucker for packaging and Canva Pro gets you there with their time-saving tools that simplify and speed up your creative process and it's all in one subscription. There's no idea too big or too small. So whether you are a student, a startup, a marketing team, nonprofit, entrepreneur, a group of crafty moms, whatever it is, design like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now, 
we're going to give you a free 45 day extended trial just because you're a stacker using our promo code. So you ready? You're going to go to canva.me, canva.me slash SB, and you're going to get free 45 days extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash S-B, canva.me slash S-B. OG825, they both think that you are high, my friend. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a tough thing when you start adding in like tractors and people and stuff. I uh, I don't know where where to draw the line, but I wasn't talking about your guests. They think you're high. For the record. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> Len, you're, Not allowed. You're 500 billion. You see, you're pretty sure OG is uh, up in the stratosphere. Well, I mean, right. I mean, what's the U.S. GDP? You, is it 20 trillion? I thought it was like closer to if it's the national debt's 30 trillion. And, and if, if the, those two are equal, I can't remember what if they are. If it's 20, 25 trillion. I mean, gosh, that's a trillions. You know, that's that's a lot. That's a lot of America's uh, GDP is just based on corn. So I don't know. Maybe it is. Well, that's how you feel. You versus OG. What about you versus Nasima with her all the way down at 60 billion? You feeling good? Uh, well, let's put it this way. I feel better. I think I've got this one. This, this oh, one. there it is. That's what we're looking for. Nasima, you don't let a smack talk bother you. You feeling good? I, you know what? My, my brain doesn't think in a trillion. So, you know, I'm just kind of keep it within the range that I can understand. What's so a, what's I'm a, feeling all right. What's a trillion or two between friends, Nasima? Come on. Exactly. Doug, what's the answer to this question? Hey, stackers, it's me, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, all this talk of corn actually reminds me of the first summer job I had, picking corn in our neighbor's garden. Things were going great until the neighbor caught me chowing down on the crop instead of picking it. What can I say? I called it profit sharing, but you know they called it stealing. Eh, difference of opinion. I had to pay a dollar a bushel I ate and... I seriously had some flossing issues to deal with back then, which reminds me, we got to deliver today's trivia answer. Corn is a big business in the United States, so how much is it worth to the economy? In 2020, the production value of corn for grain amounted to around $61.04 billion. Now that's a lot of corn. Turns out I'm not the only fan of this holiday. You know what? I might go pop some popcorn to celebrate. Why not? Popcorn all around. See ya. Wow. <laughs> Good job, Nasima. Almost nailed it. <laughs> Nasima, almost exactly. I tell you. Man. That, big. <laughs> that was a good guess. She's like, I'm going lower. What made you to 60? Like, how did you pick 60? Just. It's a round number. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> well, Paula can't win on her own, but Nasima could win for her. So that's good. I'm uh, so happy. Paula should call me and thank me personally. She, I, I think oh, she needs to. The type yeah. of season she's having, she needs to. Hey, before hey, Nasima, it's just it's just good that OG didn't win. He's running away with it. So that's good. We anybody but OG. Before Nasima gets too big ahead here, let's take out the magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. Nasima, you know when you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, what happens, don't you? Oh, of course. And we get to magnify. <laughs> Click the we link. You can do it. <laughs> we, <laughs> no, I can't. We get to comparison shop, unlike we did earlier in this article where we just picked one bank. We can see all the banks that there are to choose from. We can shop for different car loans, different interest rates on houses. So we can magnify our money in a multitude of ways. Amazing. Over 92% of the products available online, all ranked as Nasima said at magnifymoney.com. Go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for more. We make a good one, two punch there, Nasima. That's good. Today, wouldn't that have been hilarious if she wouldn't have known that answer, but she'd know what corn contributes to the economy, <laughs> but she couldn't have answered the magnify money question. That would have been that, funny. That would have been, today, we're going to help Matt and Matt's spouse magnify their money. Say hi, Matt. 
Hey, Joe and OG, this is Matt from Atlanta, Georgia. I had a question for you. So my wife is a speech therapist, and she works part-time as a 1099 contractor for another therapist. And during the pandemic over the last year, she's had some extra time off and started to think about it and do some math and realized that she could essentially double her hourly rate by going into business for herself versus working for this other therapist. The downside would be she would have to figure out some of the systems like medical billing and um, scheduling kids. And so there's there's a lot of fear and hesitation on her end about the uh, the headache of the extra administrative tasks, which I'm trying to encourage her that it wouldn't be as bad once she gets going. Uh, so I was hoping you guys could help me think through, is there anything I'm not thinking about as far as going into business fully for yourself? Uh, for some. Thanks. And of course the recorder cut him off, but thank you, Matt, for the question. I think we got all of it. And by the way, thanks to your wife too, as a guy that is a natural stutterer and had lots of speech therapy growing up, man, how just great, great work from those people. Guys, what do you think? Uh, Going into business could double the hourly rate. Len, what's your first thought? Yeah, absolutely. I I would. I mean, it's always better. Working for the man is you're never going to get rich working for the man. I've sort of told my kids that too. It's like the people who really are well off and you'd be surprised the people who do things for themselves and they start their own businesses or do their own thing uh, because the man takes, you know, he's in it to make money naturally. But like I said, you're not going to make money unless you do it for yourself. So yes, go ahead. Don't worry about uh, things like you know, how am I going to pay the, you know, do the payroll and all that. There's all that's automated. You can buy software for all that kind of stuff. And, uh, takes, takes a lot of the, uh, the guesswork out of it. How does don't be intimidated? Well, I was going to ask Len, how does he alleviate her concern then for that area? Cause I know how scary that can be. I mean, I didn't start a podcast for a year. You remember this? OG? we didn't start for a year only because like I knew all the sound equipment piece you and I had worked in radio before. I couldn't figure out how the hell this file got from us here in this discussion onto my little phone. Like, like that took me a year to get over that, that one little hurdle, which Nasima, you probably have seen. It's the easiest thing on earth. Like it is so easy to get the file there. How do you, how do you get rid of that fear, Len? I think you just jump. You've got to just jump in and just do it. You, you got to throw your fears away being an entrepreneur or being, I mean, you have to be willing to take those risks And I mean, fear is your worst enemy when you're starting a business. You've just got to jump in. You've got to set a goal and do whatever you have to do to to meet those goals. But don't be afraid. Just get your feet wet and it'll get easier. You'll learn. You will learn over time. Just get going. It sounds like what you're really saying is go ahead and be afraid, but don't let it stop you. Yes, that's a good way to put it. I mean, that's natural, right? The natural, the fear is natural, but you will look back and you will thank yourself. Nasima, serious head nodding going on from you. Yeah, I mean, like when he was asking the question, I knew the answer already because as a speech therapist, I feel like there is so much unlimited potential for her earning because it's it's something that's truly needed. And I know that she wasn't maximizing her income working on call for somebody I just think the sky is the limit for her. And I think this is like the greatest time to start a business because number one, you have a whole bunch of resources like Lynn was saying that are automated as far as like you already have like box, like it just in a box, like payroll, insurance, all those things where it's just plug and play. But then also there's an opportunity to network like no other when she can network with other speech therapists who have done that, that can cut that learning curve in half. And there are so many resources just on your everyday social media platforms where she can get in contact with someone, if not someone in her professional organizations or at um, her current job, or if she ain't scared, just ask the person that she works for. I mean, most likely she'll be able to, or they'll be able to share with you the information. So it's really not that hard. There is the fear of the unknown, but yes, her earning potential is limitless. And I would say, go ahead, girl. But you and Len talk a good game, Nasima. But you both work for somebody else. You're not doing that yourself. So 
why not? Why didn't you go off on your own and I don't know, be a, what a midwife? I don't know. <laughs> deliver babies, deliver babies on your own. That's a very interesting question because I'm actually a nurse practitioner and I could start my own practice uh, in could. whatever I wanted to. But this is my thing. As I said in the beginning, I have my personal finance platform. I have my podcast. I have my two kids. So it's easy for me to go to work and collect my checks and then be able to focus on all this other stuff. So it's just about the timing that I'm in my life right now. I'm at in my life right now, but it seems like she's in a position where she can transition. For me, it's just, I mean, delivering babies is easy. Running a podcast is hard. <laughs> so I would say the exact opposite, but <laughs> Hey, Joe, I want to I want to ask answer your question, too, is why why I'm not, you know, if when you're going to do it, it's always more convenient to do it when you're younger and before you've got a family and before you've got, you know, when you can take those risks and the impacts of those risks are a lot less. For me, obviously, I was working for the man. I got a job and then I got married and I had kids. And before you know it, the risk of going out on my own and leaving, uh, to me, it being as risk averse as I am, I decided it wasn't worth it for me. It was the trade off was I was happy where I was. I was making good money and I liked the bennies and I was willing to stick with working with the man. Um, that didn't preclude me, though, from going off and, and if I wanted to, finding side hustles. Right. And then once I retire here, I can always start working with not worrying about conflicts of interest. I can go into my field and if I wanted to and work that way and start a business, an engineering business that way. Um, so it's kind of where you are in your life, too. Right. So that's why I tell my kids, if you're going to do this, start early, start now. Think about it when you're younger. That's the time to do it. Start your business when you have less risk. You have to less to worry about if your risks don't quite work out, if your dreams don't work out. Well, and something else, and, and I love all that, Len. Something else while you were talking that I was thinking of was something Nasima said about speech therapists as well. If she already has a line of people at the door that so she doesn't have to worry about marketing that much, Len. I mean, if you started a new business in your field, you'd probably have to do a fair amount of marketing, I would think, to get out there doing it. Uh, for her, if she already has a bunch of patients waiting. Yep. Yep. That's true. That is one of the hardest parts. I want to talk to you two first because both of you uh, full-time work for somebody else. Oh, gee, you've worked for yourself for a long time. So uh, what would you say to Matt and his spouse? Yeah, only ever worked for myself. Never had a W-2 job. So I don't know what that's like to get a W-2 paycheck. Is it cool? Like every week you get the same check and... and uh, It's so cool. You <laughs> never awesome. worry about anything? You know? You get like health provided, employer provided benefits and stuff like that. Like when you get a 401k match, it's not just really you just giving yourself money from one different pocket. <laughs> like, yeah, I got a 401k <laughs> match today. So what's up? <laughs> I like the I like the five weeks of paid vacation. I mean, there are right there are there are bennies to working yeah, for the man. There sure. there are bennies, but I, you're never gonna. Your better odds of getting wealthy are working for yourself. Yeah. The only caution, I, and both of you have already said everything that needs to be said on this. The only the only thing that I would add to it is make sure that you're not just trying to get a better job. You know, because a lot of times, and this is talked about extensively in the E Myth which is a great entrepreneurial book. And before you walk out of your door and tell your boss to shove it, you got to read this book and probably the second book too, which is kind of sort of an offshoot of the first one, kind of rehashing the same thing, but it's, you know, like vitamin C, you just lose it in after a bit of time. You in need fact, OG, oh, there is a book specifically, The E-Myth for Physicians, which is a oh, sm smaller book, but specifically about how uh, physicians will set up a practice the wrong way. Yeah. Um, so recommend that one well, too. The whole concept behind this is that at the end of the day, just be sure that you actually want to be a business owner, an entrepreneur, the CEO of a company. You want to do that stuff and not just, you want to go make more money doing your job. Because if you just want to go make more money doing your job, you could probably, like we talked about earlier, ask for a pay raise or find a competitor in town and try to get a pay raise from them, you know, and, and have all that security associated with the job. But if you, but if you do start your own business, recognize that there's more to it. You have to be good at that. And then you also have to be good at the other stuff. And it's not just, you know, it's not, I don't say it to, to scare you off from it because it's not a big deal, but it is a whole different thing, you know, running payroll and insurance and stuff. We go, ah, it's, it's an app. You can download it. 
yeah, it is, but you still have to do it and you still have to have, you know, you still have to work through that. That's just a different thing that you do. There's a lot of benefits to it. You get to set your own hours. You get to charge your patients, whatever you want to charge them. You get to, you know, work the days you want to work and not the days you don't. And you don't report to anybody. So there's a lot of great things on that, but just make sure that the motivation isn't, I think I'm underpaid and I want to get paid more versus I want to start something and control the destination of this, you know, of this endeavor. And, uh, and if that's the case, then, uh, I think it's great to be an entrepreneur. There's no better calling and no better work to do than to, uh, take your thing that you do and put it out there for the universe and, and, and help other people with it. So I'd say go for it. Also, just make sure you're going for it for the right reasons. Thanks for the question, Matt, and uh, good luck to the two of you. If you've got a question like Matt had, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, and we're happy to have the team answer your question as well. And we'd love to hear a follow-up, find out, Matt, uh, what she decides to do. That would be really interesting to hear when she goes into business for herself. Love to know. Uh, That's going to do it for today, everybody. Let's find out what's happening where you all are live and work. And OG, we'll start with you, man. Big plans this weekend? As a matter of fact, yes. We are going to the beach on Saturday. Show so, off. So see you later. Call me at 555-1212. <laughs> it's my new phone number. And I'm the guy that's face down in the sand. It's a very sunburned because he had way too many beers for breakfast. Ouch. That does... Uh, <laughs> Sounds like fun for the first part of that experience, but not the rest. Will our guest of honor go last? Uh, Mr. Penzo, what's going on at LenPenzo.com? Hey, with the inflation raging, I cover this week uh, gold and silver benchmarks for wages and commodities. It's, it's really remarkable when you measure things in terms of gold and silver. The prices stay remarkably stable. So we look at the minimum wage going all the way back to the Greek times. Uh, we look at the price of commodities and what they cost back in uh, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago versus what they cost today. And it's just remarkable how when you measure them in gold or silver – uh, the prices are almost identical. Almost like uh, Bitcoin, really. Everything just stays kind of flat. <laughs> well. No? <laughs> that's uh, apples and oranges. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> like, an, like an apple and a... And a, and a kumquat. <laughs> yeah, an apple and a piece of lumber. I got no idea. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Even better. Right. Nasima, it was so awesome having you back. It was about time you came back to the basement and partied with us. Yes, I'm so honored. And I was just thinking when I was here last time, I was very pregnant. And I think I had my daughter like a couple days after we filmed the show. And she is two and a half years old now. Has so it been, it has been a while. No way. Really? Yes. <laughs> that is so sad. That is so sad. <laughs> we got to have you back on way sooner than that again. Way, way sooner than that. But tell everybody about the podcast, because last time we talked about the blog, you had you had not been blogging that long, I think, when you were here last time. And so let's talk no. about nurses on fire. So does that mean, you know, flames stuff? Or Yeah, I mean, just imagine a nurse running down the hallway with their hair on fire. That's what I do. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's pretty much me every night at work. But <laughs> again, it's a podcast that introduces nurses to the FIRE movement, which is financially independent, <laughs> financial independence for retire early. I share stories of nurses who have achieved FIRE or nurses who are on the pathway to FIRE or various ways where you can increase your income as a nurse. Because like I said, I think nursing is the ultimate hack to financial independence because we can most of the time write our own checks and there's limitless possibilities for us as nurses. Um, We have awesome benefits like uh, 457s and all these kind of crazy things that we can optimize for early retirement. So I am there and Nurses on Fire, but I am also, you know, promoting my new book, Smart Money, for all you guys out there that don't want to make the same mistakes as me financially. I wrote a book and it's just written, you know, by this simple girl from West Oakland that explains money in a way that I can understand because I'm not as smart as these gentlemen on the stage but (laughs) 
are in the basement. I don't know but, about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you I know, I know. have, um, <laughs> I have made a lot of money mistakes. And so I share my lessons that I've learned along the way. So well, that's smart what, money is out and on in bookstores or on Amazon right now. Awesome. And we will link to it and it's just, it's a walk through the basics, right? I mean, walk yeah. through all those things that seem at first, not very sexy, but the stuff that people really need to know. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we'll link to it in our show notes and to the podcast and the blog. Uh, I feel like when Naseeba's on and this and that and the fourth (laughs) thing she's doing on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you've got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? Sure thing, Joe. I'll tell everybody what we should have learned today. First, take a lesson from our roundtable. Just because something is a financial rule of thumb, that doesn't mean it's right for you. I mean, everybody's got different thumbs, right? Second, looking for scholarships? Maybe teaching your child life lessons that will spill over into the real world is a better way to attack the high cost of education. But the big lesson? Don't mention popcorn until Joe, OG, Len, and Nasima aren't listening. These leeches want me to send them some corn. Make your own corn. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To learn more from Nasima McElroy, just head over to financiallyintentional.com or check out her new book, Smart Money, the step-by-step personal finance plan to crush debt. And to see what Len Penzo is up to, just head on over to waynenewton.com. I'm kidding. Go to that old lenpenzo.com site you've been to like a million times before. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahigh, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and there's a 73% chance that I played Chuck on Happy Days. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. So, Nasima, how many babies have you delivered so far? Do you yeah, oh, my God. Have you um, kept track? Do you keep track? No, I try to do, like, averages, and the last time I counted is over 1,000. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Over That's great. Over 1,000 over how, what length of time? 12 years. Holy cow. Yeah. I remember the last time you were here, you were telling us stories <laughs> about, uh, about husbands uh, fainting. Yeah, didn't we? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. So I'm talking to you. That's right. Oh, yeah, go, we always have the an eye juice. on it. We always have an eye on the dad, and we're like, "Listen, honey, we're, we don't need another patient, so we need you to go sit down." How many dads come in who have just eaten a tuna fish sandwich? Hey, easy. Oh. I'm right here. <laughs> I am right oh, here. It's worse. It is worse than that. The of, it's it's like the stuff doesn't go away. I make one drunken mistake with coleslaw, and I'm still getting reviews about it on our show. I mean, have hey, we, let me just ask you this before you move on. Did the tuna have pickles in it? I, or I, pickle relish? I, I don't like all that crap in my tuna. Do you? I, I pickles. No, I don't. No. But a lot of people do.
I love pickles. Pickles. Maybe cucumbers. If you don't have pickles, you can do cucumbers. Same, same. We were just fresh. No, yuck. We were just in uh, the hill country of Texas and we stopped at this great restaurant and the uh, server, she was fantastic. But she said, she's like, now we just do our tuna salad though. We, we just do it just straight ahead. Just tuna salad. There's no, like, I'm going to be disappointed that there's not all this muckety muck messing it up. This past weekend, I went to a wedding of a friend of mine here in Texas and his family is from Florida. Her family is from California and they, you know, they live here. So it's a COVID wedding. They were married a year ago in just a quick ceremony they were supposed to have their wedding last year. And so this year was the party and they, it was catered with barbecue and mm. yeah, like barbecue sandwiches and barbecue tacos for appetizers. And, you know, there's, there's brisket and chicken and, and pulled pork and beans and potato salad. And just, you know, just like you're at a barbecue place and we went up there for a dinner and the guy who's serving the the brisket, you know, he's like, Oh, would you like some brisket? I'm like, yeah, of course. And then like the next four people behind us are like, you could see him kind of looking and going, nah, I'm good. And I, and I just kind of looked back at the guy and I went, they're not from around here. And he's <laughs> like, I can tell. Cause you could see the w- people at the wedding are like, so baked beans and potato salad. It's like, no, no, this is barbecue, man. Like, this is, get come some. on. This is yes. really good. And it was, it was actually yes. really, good, really, really quite surprisingly good too, uh, which is fun. But Fantastic. Uh, you might not poop for a week, but who cares? <laughs> Is that, is, that, is, is that too far? Is that too far? I don't know. Nasima, what is the wildest thing, though, that's ever happened? Are you allowed to say this happened when oh, you're yeah. delivering a baby? Oh, I, crazy things. Joe, you are asking for it. <laughs> you know the stuff that happens. This This whole episode, I'm just asking for it. Let's see. A lady comes in. She's like ready to go. She's about to pop this baby out. And I check her and, you know, we do it manually with our fingers and I come out and there's poop on my finger. And that means the baby's butt is down. (laughs) So instead of a vaginal delivery, we have to do a crash C-section. So those are the kind of exciting things that we have to do. But that baby probably will not forgive me for where I placed my finger. You know what? There's poop on my finger right now. <laughs> and cut. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> What are you still doing here? Even the dessert is over. Well, as long as you're here, did you know that with a more rewards credit card from Navy Federal Credit Union, you can earn three times the points at supermarkets, food delivery and gas, plus one point on everything else. Your rewards aren't going to expire while your account's open and you can redeem them for cash, travel, gift cards, and more. The cool thing, stackers, is because you pay off your credit card every month like you should, you can play the reward game. And with this reward card, the more rewards card is contactless. You can make payments quickly and securely with just a tap of your card. By the way, speaking of rewards, you'll get a Navy Federal auto loan. You can get one. It doesn't say you will get one, but you can get one and reward yourself with that new car that you need to get from place to place. Playing's easy. You can get it on their mobile app, online or by phone. It's so fast. You'll get a decision in seconds. Right now, rates are as low as 1.79% APR. Plus, with Navy Federal's car buying service powered by True Car, which is so awesome. I've saved so much money using that. You can shop, compare, and save on your next new or used car. So whether it's your first car or your dream car, Navy Federal can help you cruise into an affordable car with a monthly payment that you know you can afford it. Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Now you can go home, stackers. Have a great day. Insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans and their families. American Express is a registered service mark of American Express. 
used by Navy Federal under license. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Rates subject to change that are based on creditworthiness. Rate available for new vehicles. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. 